I feel fellowship may be for you. So most of us had exposure to high procedural volume. Um, so we came out with 300 EBIS procedures from our fellowship. So that's, that wasn't normal for that day. We had exposure to rebus. We had exposure to valves. I had exposure to stent. Um, so it was very easy for me to make that transition. Most of us fell in love with critical care because it had a little bit of mixture and a little bit of diversity. So depending on how far you are from fellowship, you may or may not have the comfort level that we have. And so if you find yourself uncomfortable, specifically stents, valves, things that are much more intricate than chlorexis, pulmonometry, those things, then it may behoove you to do that. But with me, because I had that exposure, even though I transitioned you know, almost eight years after, um, I still had enough reps under my belt to show that I could do things uh, proficiently, efficiently, and safely. And so if you don't have that comfort level, then we would certainly suggest that maybe doing an IP fellowship would be appropriate. But most of us went through fellowship with the amount of touches that allowed us to have at least enough cojones to try it. Um, on our own, um, and most of us were, were successful, or all, all of us in the panel were successful. So we would hope the same for you. The biggest thing is that mentorship to know um, when you have blind spots, when you need um, to move forward with additional training, but you don't absolutely have to have IP training as you can see here. Or I think, IP board. I think it's important to see that you know, you've got four panelists here, none of who are IP certified, and yet we've made a successful career out of doing advanced bronchoscopy. So if that's a decision that you're struggling with or you have questions about, I don't think it's necessary to be IP certified, necessarily or IP boarded, as long as you have the procedural skill set, you feel comfortable in what you're able to offer as you're looking for a job and kind of represent yourself as an advanced bronchoscopist. I think that's key. Um, I think kind of jumping into the next part about stepping stones to career success, we talked about you know procedural um, capabilities and skills and efficiency. I think it's important to also talk about stakeholders if you're trying to advertise yourself, especially if you're coming out of fellowship. So, um, panelists, what kind of thoughts do you have about how best to advertise yourself as a bronchoscopist, especially for those coming straight out of fellowship? And if you some, I'll have you start first because you're yeah. one of those kind of. No, no, fresh. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm fresh, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I think I think that that was a very important question and and. Uh, one of my mentors um, had, and I have asked that specific question exactly where the end. The, the answer was, um, is to focus your, your, your skills on um, one target at a time. So let's say you're, you're, you, you have to understand what the need is and what type of geographical location and services are offered at that location. And then what, what type of skills you have or what type of skills you want to grow and then from there, find find your target and focus that target. If that is uh, doing a DLVR program, then that's what you're gonna be your focus. And you need to know what the ends and outs of, of that decision. And I think you know, partnering with 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 industry is not is not the is not the it's not an option really. It's 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 a part of who you do who you are as a procedurist because you are um, the arm that is performing the procedure that is provided by the industry that made that tool or that machine or that robot or whatever that is and then the better you understand it and the better your relationship with the reps at the at the OR or the endoscopy suite the better your outcome and then the more you're able to look at that retrospectively and then analyze why am I not getting the new I want to how how what's my problem you ask your reps I mean, you guys have been with people that do this for a living, and they are they're pioneer. Where where am I? Where am I wrong? Do I need to, to improve in this aspect? Do I need to stop doing this? Do I need to really revisit that topic and not not score? So I think focus your target on what you want to achieve by understanding what the, what is the need that you want, and then that's in in partner with industry. And that's, you know, there's no other choice really. So. So really just probably have a niche for yourself if you're looking for you know, what kind of job or what kind of procedures that you're focusing on. Um, Dominic, do you have any thoughts or yeah. comments? I don't think you really gotta know who you are as a person, like what gets you up in the morning, what gets you ticking, and that's what I found out when I did my IP rotations, you know. We had terrible days, you'd be there at six in the morning, you'd be at eight in the evening, and yet you came back every day for more, this was so much fun. I really enjoyed that. 
Um, and then the second part is when you get to your new facility, I left academics, went into community practice. Uh, the advice that I got from one of the NIH uh, attendings was take, take the time to figure out what they do and how they work. So I didn't jump in there and say, I'm doing bronchoscopy and I'm leaving them. Like, I sat back for like three years, figured out what makes this system work. Why do they do the things they should do? Um, don't try to change the culture if you don't actually understand why it's, if there's a reason that it's there. So take that time to figure it out. Um, and then start building relationships with folks. Um, when it came to working with our robotic uh, platform, we didn't have anyone else that was doing it. So we spoke to the folks who were doing uh, robotic procedures in the OIs and got them to be our champions to move it forward. Um, so it's, as you said, you know, uh, know who you are, know the environment that you're in, and then take the time to engage uh, relevant stakeholders. And you, Dominique, would set me up well. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I echo what they said. Um, moving from a ICU, pulmonary, sleep medicine, everybody gets everything, um, I had to make a pitch, right? So when you make a pitch, I already knew what the obstacles and barriers were going to be. So before I accepted the job, it was who are the stakeholders, right? So how do I assemble the stakeholders and have a working group beforehand? So you want me, you want to be successful, where are you right now? Okay, what's your stage? What's your timeliness? What's your complication rate? How many of these are being done in IR versus endoscopy? Problem number one. What do you want to solve? You want earlier stage, you want less complications, you want more timely care. You have a problem. I can solve your problem. How am I going to solve the problem? How do I move patients from IR into endoscopy? How do I grow a funnel? How do I decrease complications? How do I improve molecular testing? What can I give you? And who do I need on my side in order to do that? Stakeholders. So what I demanded of them before accepting the job was that I had to have those stakeholders at a meeting every two weeks for six weeks, and then every six weeks for three times, and then three months, and then we rinse and repeat. We still need every three months, right? So how do we improve? How do we get better? And those stakeholders may look a little bit different. You have to have a C-suite person. You have to have somebody in your oncology service line who's invested or a pulmonary service line who's invested. The radiology investment, the pathology investment, the anesthesia investment. You have to have an endoscopy or surgical director investment. So there's a, a huge laundry list, and we can share that with you. But go in prepare. Go in with a battle plan. Tell them that you need business. You have a problem. I can fix your problem. I am just one person, okay? I may need a piece of capital equipment, but a physician with a piece of capital equipment will not make a program. I need a battle plan. So when you go in and ask for these jobs, go in and organize that you need these stakeholders in order to perfect your craft. And then you rinse and you repeat it. You won't get it right the first time. You're not gonna hit it on the mark. But when you have problems, you have a team of people. When I first started, I moved from one institution down the street, five minutes. Same doctor. I've been doing EBIS my entire life. EBIS, EBIS, EBIS. And I moved, and my EBIS diagnostic yield went down. I could EBIS with my eyes closed by this time. What we realized is that we had a processing problem. Okay, so we had a quality control problem. It wasn't me. It was they were processing differently. They had a spin time different sheet that was different. They had a aliquot that was different. But you were able to specifically hone in when things did not look normal because we had stakeholders who were vested. Know who needs to be at the table. Don't take no for an answer. Go in prepared. What's your baseline? What would you like to improve upon? And I think I told somebody this, like, undersell yourself. Okay, so I'm going to improve this 10%. Okay, the first time we came in, we improved them 200%. Okay, so as far as the number of patients that we put through, our diagnostic yield went up, our stage went up, go in with some element, call their baby ugly. Okay, how do we fix that? And who are the people who are going to make that better? But go in strategically and, and don't accept anything less than that. Your stakeholders are your friends. Um, you mentioned diagnostic yields again. How important is it to focus on diagnostic? Sell yourself to. We to had this question a little bit earlier, and I, I've had kind of this revolution, this uh, uh, revelation tonight. And maybe it's not so much diagnostic yield, but the number of patients I diagnosed with cancer, right? So it's not, I got to build the funnel, I got to refine the funnel to make sure that I'm taking the right people to procedure. I want my touches 
to equal cancer when I'm doing bronchoscopy, right? So my diagnostic yield may be all over the place depending on what I use or what patients I take, but if I'm really doing my job, then I am going to get an accelerated cancer diagnosis with each touch if I do it correctly, meaning I built the funnel correctly, I would stratify them per, um, appropriately. When I get those numbers to go up, and that's what we're doing, is to see that when we take them to procedure, that we're taking people with a high pretest probability, and not only are we getting a diagnosis, we're getting an early stage cancer diagnosis, and those patients are reverting to surgery. So start with the end in mind, collect your data. Right, and when you look at your diagnostic field, if you're having a lot of benign diagnosis, are you risk stratifying? Think about what you're doing in that care continuum that can make you more appealing to your hospital system. What makes me appealing to my hospital system is that those patients end up in the operating room or they end up with SBRT. And so 60% of the time, right now, I will find an early stage patient every time I put that patient for, to sleep for robotic bronchoscopy on hospital pays attention. But I'm collecting the data to show that takes refining that funnel. So, so going back to your original question, you need an IP fellowship to do all that, right? And I think that's a question that people wrestle with quite a bit. Um, and, and I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are now. If you had today, like back when Susan and I trained, there were like only eight from the country, right? So you had to move your family no matter where you ended up to do, to do it. Today, with the technology exploding, would you recommend an IP fellowship? I'm just curious. And sometimes, and I think Susan alludes to this, you, you feel that you have your blind spots. That patient comes in that needs yeah. a stent. There's a patient who has a stage three or stage four, and you know you could have done something if you had that training. Fortunately, you can refer them. So are they the majority? No. I mean, the vast majority of the patients that I'm seeing are the ones where we could use uh, robotic technology, get to catch them early, stage two, stage one and advance the care, and we wouldn't have had, you don't need IP training for that. I would agree with you, I'm just trying to sort of like make yeah, it interactive. Yeah. At the same time, I mean like, uh, so we've got Hasneen, who uh, he, he went back and did interventional family training after doing 10 years in Kenosha, and there was a reason you did that. And I, and I agree with what just part of your statement, that we need more and more people, you know, not everybody has to be, you know, gone through formal training, or gone through an IP fellowship. Because as long as you have the exact first statement, right, as long as you had the skills, and as long as what Susan said, you realize the limitations, you realize what you can work with, whom you can work with. And if you have somebody in your system that you can call for difficult cases. Can I be honest with you? I think there are 40 programs. We are about 600 or 650 of us IP boarded. If the rate that we go, we're gonna be 650 and then maybe 690 and then 7.30 and so forth. If we have to have more people do what we do and have a much higher volume to also uh, talking about finances, negotiate with insurance companies and see where we stand like the cardiologists do it, then we need to have more of us doing procedures. We can't be working at a snail's pace and having 40 of us produced every year. Did, that, did I make sense at all? Just pop <coughs> <laughs> I was trying to stress, stress about the, the technician part of this. I always wanted to add, the, the whole, so years ago I chose specifically not to pursue an interventional pulmonary fellowship. And our program, you know, has exponentially grown in bronchoscopy volume, but our rigid bronchoscopy and chloroscopy volume have remained exactly the same as it was when we could get it. There is absolutely no growth in rigid or fluoroscopy in the United States. In fact, as we continue to make progress towards earlier diagnosis, the need for stenting should continue to decline. And so the problem is, is that, and maybe, so this is not an anti-interventional pulmonary discussion. It's more a discussion of, you know, what does an IP fellowship get you? If you come from a fellowship that's done very little to no bronchoscopy, advanced or otherwise, then you ought to do an IP fellowship. Because you need to do robots and stents and bowels and yada yada and, and ebus is evil. But if you come from a program and you've got a lot of reps across these things, then do you really need to go spend a year just to learn how to put in maybe an occasional silicone stent, kind of? Or could you keep doing what you're doing best and find out that who in your area could do that for you on the off chance that you need a Y stent, right, for example? Silicone. Now there's some expanding. Let's move that. Okay. Did you get my point? Yeah. 
I'm actually, I, 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 I hear you, Dr. Hogan, and uh, I think uh, Tom makes a great point. So do you, just follow your question was, um, do you need to do an IT training fellowship an entire year to really do what Susan was talking about? Well, Susan, and I would say myself, kind of do a lot of the similar things, right? But um, Susan kind of went through this maturation process, and what Dominic was describing was kind of like a maturation process of just not just your practice, your career, your setting your goals. That takes time, right? And you're supposed to do an IP fellowship after you're done with the training, right? So like, you have to make, and you don't have that time to kind of do that. You know, Hassan's the, the, the exception. Right, kind of doing it later. And then, the, but the question comes though, today, the number of procedures, even though paroscopy and some of the rigid stuff has sort of, you know, not taken off, mm -hmm. but is there a um, greater need, because the, endo, the endobronchial options are gonna explode during our generation, this next generation, right? During Hasnan's, your career, your Dominic's your career, we're a little bit older, but for the younger people, I know. Sorry, Susan, we are older. <laughs> but, but just look, some of the IP fellowships don't teach you valves. So you spent one year with advanced bronchoscopy training, extensive bronchoscopy training, and you arrive and you don't know how to place a valve after you finish that training. Because depending on the training program, if they're a major cancer center, there are no valves placed. So does that mean, no, this is not the most complicated procedure to learn. That's not the point. Like, where's the growth? Do you need to spend a year learning to do a procedure that you're not necessarily going to do? And by the way, the number of jobs that let you do just IP, you will not be doing ICU, you will not be doing consults, you will not be doing the sleep lab. There aren't many of them left. Right. So you will be doing some regular general pulmonary after your super sub-specialized year. That's you going to do a whole year of interventional cardiology and still just doing general cards, yeah. right? And so that's the other thing. Yeah, I think that was my, my, my thought is for, because I also wear, I'm the pulmonary director for all of HCM, so 180 hospitals, right? So I was the first only procedure-based pulmonologist within HCA, and I'm not IP boarded. That made them really uncomfortable, right? So, because we're setting a precedent now, because you have expertise and you have the reps, but it's not normal to then approach a healthcare system and say, I want to be a pure proceduralist, but I'm not IP boarded. However, their first person was. So you can show the reps and you can show proficiency, but it, you have to be able to show that, right? You have to have the data logs to show that you can do this effectively. We're not saying that you can't, but just know that when you go out, if you're looking for a pure procedure-based job, right. they are going to ask you why you're not IP boarded, right? And so you have to be prepared to answer. Mm -hmm. And so be prepared when you walk into that, that you do have the experience with your fellowship. If you don't, because right? they will expect you, and again, maybe make allowances for that. So know the know the, the risks. So for us, man, if I need to watch them, call an Otis Rickman, right? And like he's literally a stone's throw for me, right? That's where I hired an IP fellow trained person. Has she placed one wise stint since she's been there in three years? No, because it doesn't happen. It's very rare. We gave one to Otis. But um, you I have ask, to know what you're getting into. Can I ask a question as well? I think the question is, uh, what the problem is, if you get an IP fellowship six years from now, the technology has changed so much in the past four years, right? So you still have to relearn the whole thing compared to IP or non-IP. Exactly, and what I tell people is, is from an experience level, when I went through training, I played valves, right? We did thermoplasty, you know, I, I did APC, <coughs> we did cautery, we did all the things, right? We EBIS, I did radio probes. Everything I'm doing now, I did none of it in fellowship other than EBIS, right? I learned it after, right? Because you have a skill set, you have a certain level of clinical acumen that you're able to bring these things in, and that's okay, right? And I learned those things on the fly like most of us did. Kyle, I don't think you did, you didn't do navigation in fellowship. And, uh, well, we had the first generation of super deep. Right, it. I mean, it's like a little like, you know, doesn't even count. Jazz ball was the same, <laughs> Jazz probably the same. I mean, most of us, what we're doing now is not what we did in fellowship. Can I also add? Steve? Sorry, but yeah. Sorry, no, I, I agree. I mean, I guess it's another one. Oh, the, uh, I, would, I, would, <laughs> I would echo, echo what Susan said. I think the thing to remember, it's not the procedure, it's not the program, it's the person. And it's who you are and how you approach this is what makes you want to continue to improve. And your, your, your education doesn't end in fellowship. It doesn't end because somebody gave you a piece of paper, just took a test and said you can do these things. 
It's how you're going to continue to build that, evolve that, and continue to ride these waves because you're either going to ride or get buried. By them. And as everything advances, and technologies and procedures, and treatments, and all these things happen, I think who you are as you start and build that out is what's going to make you continue to want to do these things and constantly be part of that. And look at this not from I'm doing Bronx for this person, but I'm building a program. I mean, you have building bronchoscopy programs. You're building lung programs above and beyond that, whether it's nodules, whether it's um, comprehensive, you know, larger other disease processes. I think that as long as you maintain that perspective of having, um, of always wanting to better yourself for the betterment of your patients, that is, that, that goal is gonna guide you. Can I also not forget that the, the folks from industry actually want you to succeed? Yes. Like, there's nothing worse than someone who sells you a device and you fuck up the next 10 patients. You we're will courted. not. Not the industry's words, but. You will not. You will not. You Depends will not on the industry. <laughs> you won't use that device again. And word will get out. And everyone will blame the device, not you. Right. They want you to be successful. Yeah. By, so, by the way, when the rep, when they offer training, and the rep says you should think about doing it this way, they're not, they're not selling you a thing. You've already chosen to use it. They're trying to have you be successful so that it gets more success. Like this, this residency approach where we've all learned that pharma's only goal is to sucker you into prescribing Spariba, right? Which we've got to get rid of that mentality. The mentality on industry on the device side is partnership to find the solution to what your problem is. And that's why there's lots of devices and you can choose whichever one to buy if you care less, but how to use it very much work with your people. Because you're right, all the things I'm doing now, like, I mean, we're going to be a whole bunch of more benign airway disease coming down. None of us are experts in it. It's all new stuff. We've all got to learn it when it comes down the pipeline. I think what, what Kyle said, I think it's very important. And we all were taught that mentality. I'm not sure if it's the same in fellowship or residency now, but it's, you do not talk to industry, right? They are the devil. Um, and I can tell you, when you're going into the C-suite, guess who has the knowledge that's already paid for? Guess who has the data that's already paid for? Industry. You want to know how many nodules are in your hospital? Ask industry. You want to know how many are done in your IR suite? Ask industry. You want to know your stage? Ask industry. You want to know how many misses you have? Ask industry. So what we did was go in, and I started with Medtronic. We moved to Monarch or J&J &J or whoever you are now, and then we moved to our current platform with ION. And I can tell you, each step of the way, what I did was lean on the industry to say, how do I then go to my C-suite and represent my data. How do I represent my problem? How do I represent my service area? Don't forget that they are going to help you formulate that plan. And then, if I need something different, hey, I'm doing robotic bronchoscopy right now. I look at my first 100 cases. Where are my misses? Ground glass opacities and eccentric lower lobe nodules. How do I fix that? Okay, maybe I need a cryo probe. Maybe I need a CO. So now I've got a business plan that I can formulate because I have the data. Guess who gave me the data? Industry. Okay, so wherever you are, think about how to bring them in because they can help you solve problems. And in fellowship, they tell us that's not the way to do business. It's the way to do business in the real world. And that mentality is still there. I just wanted to probably speak to that too. Having just recently graduated, I think we have very little pharmaceutical or drug companies that come into training or, or fellowship to advertise anything. So how do you make those connections? How do you leverage those mm -hmm. industry connections? Um, You know, a little just just something um, to, to Jasper's question. Um, a one year of interventional pulmonology is not going to teach you um, this. Nobody is, in a year is going to focus on how do you funnel your program and how do you build relationships with the industry and how do you become a better bronchoscopist and how do you fix your errors? How do you go back and look at all this? A year is not going to do that. A year is going to teach you how to use a certain device that is the device that's being used at this current time. Um, I think um, you, I think for, for, for current fellows, um, probably the best advice would be is you are a bronchoscopist for three years. So take, use that opportunity to your advantage. Uh, you're holding the scope every, from day one until, until um, 700 days after, and that's uh, already 100 days. Um, 
But we gotta work on the math part. Can you hear what he said? He has industry to help with the math. <laughs> If you need more confidence, right, because it's going to change. I can tell you the people I feel like have, have been blessed the most in fellowship are the ones who have stood up, and I, I hate to use this analogy, but they've stood up in tumor board, and their response is to, why did your bronch not be diagnostic? Why did your EBIS, the, the EBIS was negative, my pet was positive. God, you're, you missed it, right? Like, people who did not have really the cojones to stand up and say that was a true negative because that EBIS with an anthracotic nod, it was an anthracotic node that was positive on pet, and this is what happens, or that was granulomatous disease, and this is what happens. So you lack the confidence to be really confident in your own skill set, right? So if that happens, and that's okay, that fellowship may give you more touches, may give you more opportunity, may give you a louder voice so you can stand up in that tumor board next time. But guess what happens? One year, Three years, five years, it's going to change. But you will have the confidence. And if that's what you need, that's okay. Yeah. That is okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think being involved, I think, you know, being part of societies, attending conferences, getting exposed to people who have been doing this, who have been um, um, at the same footsteps that you are in. Like, you know, uh, when I talk to colleagues, like I talk to Dominique or I talk to Jeff Spall, I talk to everybody. I mean, they'll tell you, um, and I think uh, <laughs> I'm making them younger. Right? No, he no, he talks a lot. <laughs> he talks to all of us with the wrong map. <laughs> yeah, but but I think being involved is the way to really open your eyes and, and what you really need to do. And I think that's uh, that's kind of the short answer. And, and I think the presence of the society shows that, right? I mean, we're all in this together. The fact that even if you're coming out and you don't know anybody, this is how you meet people. And every one of us work towards succeeding. Everyone's got my cell phone. It's always there. If you question, you call. No matter whether I mention once or a hundred times, that's that's how we all operate. I guess. And I think we all want to make sense. This is the type of involvement that I think helps guard those initial relationships. You can build out and then give that back down the road. And that's, that's the goal. Yeah, I don't think Emily. I'm not sure. I think we were going to start too with some of the, the ancillary options that we have with SAB. I think what, this is this is the power of numbers, right? So I think the thing that we feel like is missing is that connectivity after you finish fellowship. How do you get connected to us? How do we get to podcasts that you may be doing? How do we get to fellows corners? How do we get to educational um, opportunities that we offer? And then what do you need, right? Like what makes the most sense for it's really gonna transform your careers? That's what we wanna hear from you as members, and, and how do we encourage that membership to grow so that we can make more of us successful together. So that really makes a big impact for us. So I think we'll, we'll show that at some point um, and have QR codes for membership and then let you guys have more information about the podcast and what we're trying to do with Fellows Corners and those things. So I'm trying to help you out there, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Hi. So Kyle may be the biggest guy when I'm going to take a pressure off Susan and Scott and so on, I think I'm the oldest guy. Rex changed his last name. It's no longer young. It's no. Rex Hall. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the issue is when you think about it, we cannot be good with everything, and that's the reality of it. And even in a quote IP program, and you know, I was at Hopkins before DFK showed up with Lonnie being the first fellow and so forth. I mean, the truth of it is back in the old metrics, and I give Kava and Moment credit to say, you know, competency is not measured by 20 Bronx or 20 TBNA or is it 20 lasers? Some get good at five, and some never gets good, you know? <laughs> and the thing is, you cannot have, you didn't, Susan, you didn't even mention PBT. I've done about 50 <laughs> PBT because I'm going to do PBT now, it augments the immune system. You do, no, because do. most places doesn't have a diode laser or a KTP laser and so on. So you cannot be good at everything, but I think as you think about it, 
This is really a bit of a SWOT discussion, and Susan really focused on what are the strengths, weaknesses, personally, institutionally, as a technology base, opportunity, and threats. And let's, I hate to say it, most countries now have two bronchoscopy programs, uh, or societies, China has it, Turkey has it, and unfortunately, it's no longer the old collegiality of John Bemis, and we were talking earlier, the Praveen Mathuris, it's changed a lot from when I was learning off the foot of the giants. And now it's too, too much competition. And the threat is if you don't have data, you will get attacked. And the thoracic surgeons were way more successful from day one in reimbursement and everything because we were having a hard time getting any reimbursement for EBUS, for TVNA. Why? Because we didn't have the data. So if the non-board certified bronchoscopists, advanced bronchoscopists, want to be successful, I think one of the things looking for societies and industry to help is to help set up a robust voluntary database and whatnot. I mean, look, I'm also a member of AAB, not IP. I'm a member of WCPIP and so on and so forth. It's okay to be collegial and recognize the realities, but you have to have data. Otherwise, you get slapped. <coughs> Professor, I think you had a good point about reimbursement that we'll come back to, but just while you have a question. Yeah, and this is, that was great by the way, Rex. Um, can I, the other thing I was gonna say is, do you think the IP programs, at least what I, my view is, Kyle talked about the mixture of what, how they're so variable. A lot of them are focused on, I can do a procedure. What is the population needs though, in my sense, is something a little bit different. I don't know, Bill, you wanna mention sort of what you're, cause you do a lot of population hope management now. Well, now I'm in industry. I've never been called the devil in a meeting before. But, um, yeah, I did. Not yet. There's, it's, it's, only, it's only six, seven o'clock. I did advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy at Columbia in New York, and I'm with Verisight now. Um, and first of all, I, I love this conversation. Um, I think that this is an, uh, an incredibly stressful decision for people who are in training. Do I do IP fellowship? Do I not? I never did IP fellowship. I was sort of grandfathered out of that. Um, but I also existed uh, or practiced in an institution where I had colleagues who I interacted with all the time. I had thoracic surgeons who wanted to do the rigid, so I didn't, have, that, wasn't, that need wasn't forced upon me. And I had this environment, and I took this job because it was an environment where it was very collaborative. I was not practicing all by myself. And even more importantly, I wasn't just doing procedures, I was taking care of patients. And it was in this collaborative environment where I was interacting with the thoracic oncologists and the thoracic surgeons, and as a group, we were all taking care of patients. And yes, I did mostly procedures, but I, I built a practice where I, I focused on giving our population of patients the care that they needed, the, the procedures that uh, that they needed, and I relied on my partners in this collaborative practice to do the things that they were good at, and they relied on me to do the things that I was good at, and over time, you build, you build a career. And yes, I, I left that after 15 years to do something else, but, but that something else is also at this collaborative, exciting, sorry, what are you? Yeah, it's a collaborative and exciting, and it's advancing patient care in a different way. So, so I think you mentioned something really important, the collaboration across the field. So when you're building a program, make sure you've got a good pathologist, and sometimes it's difficult, and a good radiologist. So you know, you work out who does what well for a particular institution. I don't think it's the same model. And I think you pointed out the other really important thing. Many of us, at least my generation, entered pulmonary because of the physiology. And we, if you want to be a good benign interventional bronchoscopist, you better know physiology and anatomy. And what's missing in this society right now in the SAB is a good international presence. I know many of us were born overseas. I'm uh, fresh off the boat from Hong Kong and Singapore. You know, I tell people I'm from no, Aki. That's not so fresh, dude. Oh, well, <laughs> <we're not. laughs> We've established that. <laughs> Holland, 
great physiologist, Alan Shaw, an older generation of like a uh, Heinrich Becker, or the Japanese are great physiologists, and Miyazawa, who talks about migrating choke points. They are physiologists, first of all. And if you just, uh, you know, or rather, we don't want to be just, are there anyone married or parents as an uh, orthopedist, right? We don't want to be just a <coughs> carpenter, kind of. <laughs> That's what you're for here. The other thing I wanted to say, um, like, there's a difference between confidence and hubris, right? You want to be able to say, this is what I know how to do, exactly what you said. Exactly. Um, uh, but but I'm, I'm confident in what I know. It was something I was listening to you talk, and I was like, I would hire you out of fellowship in a heartbeat. <laughs> Thank you. In, in a heartbeat, because you're, you're confident, and you know your limits, and you want to work with people and uh, do what you do. So, And I would say that for all, all three of you. Which you've heard me do. <laughs> <laughs> In a heartbeat. <laughs> so I think the other part to you know building a workoscopy program other than training that Rex put on was reinforcement. Workoscopy is a oh. business, and especially for those that want a pure proceduralist job, that's not something that exists. You can't support yourself. So um, let's talk a little bit about the business side of workoscopy. What does that mean? How does that? <laughs> service pulmonary critical care physicians are not in the procedure lab, right? Why are you not in the procedure lab? It does not pay. It's inefficient. The model is horrendous, right? You don't have block time. You don't know when anesthesia is going to show up. You can't get in any time. You're in the OR. You can even have a Bronx suite. Um, so there is a tremendous amount that goes into it. Luckily, we are now beginning to get some data. So if you're not familiar with the data, fair market valuation is the buzzword, right? So how do you go to a healthcare system and say what you are worth? Thank God that we now have AIBFE's data that says your fair market valuation should not be less than, at least this gives you some blueprint, right? So if you're in academia or if you're in private practice, what are your RVU valuations? The problem is, is that as proceduralists, we cannot produce as many RBUs as an ICU physician. We cannot produce as many RBUs as a pulmonary critical care physician. When we, there's a couple ways to go about this. So when we go into an ICU contract, right, when I went into my ICU contract, the way we made that contract was I won't enter a dedicated ICU contract unless you pay me at least 80% of what I would make in my clinic, which is insured patients, I have an average number of this many touches a day for this much reimbursement based on my mix of Medicare and commercial pay. So I'm not going to enter into an ICU contract unless you cover me. Why would we as advanced bronchoscopists enter into a bronchoscopy space where we're a dedicated proceduralist, but yet you're paying me 12 cents on the dollar of what I would make if I was in the ICU? It's, it doesn't make any sense, right? So we have to go in knowing our work. Okay, now we have some data with Lidini's paper with AABFP saying this is what your work is based on 2022. They're saying that we need to make $65 per RBU. So that's higher than a pulmonary procedure. So it's higher than a pulmonary physician. Go in knowing what your data is. I went from fee for service to a dedicated RBU that said I was just a general pulmonary RBU. I had to make a case to move up to a higher RBU rate because I'm not general pulmonologist. I'm not a critical care physician. I'm not efficient. I also need to know how to maximize my per patient touch. So how do I do a telehealth visit for three RBUs? How do I do a procedure for 11 RBUs? And how do I do a prolonged care visit after, which is reimbursed by Medicare and commercial, for another two RBUs to package that together so every time I touch that patient and I use my brain, I'm getting reimbursed, and I'm getting reimbursed at what he says I should in first, not general pulmonary, but an IP physician, because I'm doing IP work. I'm an advanced bronchoscopist. I'm doing IP work, know my work. So don't go in and have somebody tell you that you're a 50th percentile general pulmonary practitioner. You're not. It's not what we deserve. So we will continue to do better, ideally, going to Congress trying to figure out how to get better reimbursement for what we do versus GI or other cardiology. But 
very difficult to move from one to the other. And if you're trying to do fee for service and do this, it's very complicated. What we would also recommend is if you're trying to get out of the ICU, like I was when you give up part of that ICU contract in your fee for service position, proposition your hospital and say, buy 25% of me. You want me to, to do your procedures for you to get downstream revenue, yet you don't want to reimburse me? Let me show you the harm you were doing me. And let me show you an option to get out of that. Just well. This is great. Uh, this is totally like great wisdom and great uh, advice. Curious, you see all these different practice models out there. And in my view, it seems like a lot of times the barriers are us, right? The pulmonary practices, the structures, the way that the, way that the, the schedules are set up. Um, how do you manage that? Like I know some of my colleagues around the country, they're so frustrated they've actually left pulmonary practices, which gets back to they're no longer taking care of pulmonary patients. They're becoming the proceduralist for a cancer institute, the proceduralist for a um, some other service, a surgical group. How do you manage that a little bit? I'm just curious because yeah, I, mean, I, I did it in steps, and so I think stepping stones is how it went. So I got out of my ICU contract half time, right? In order to get out of that, I needed to find to compensate that payment. So I need my overhead covered. So if you're a fee for service position, your overhead is, is what gets you, right? So I had my hospital pay my overhead so I could start the nodule clinic. When I moved into a pure proceduralist contract, I joined a thoracic surgery group, so I did not do general pulmonary anymore, but I negotiated a higher RVU rate in order to be out of general pulmonary. So it's, it's very different. There are a couple different ways that you can do it, but it, it takes having the forethought about that fair market valuation in order to get out of some of those things. And that ICU contract nomenclature really helped me have that conversation that why would I leave my clinic and go into the ICU if I wasn't compensated for it? Same thing, why would I go into bronchoscopy school if I wasn't compensated for it? You have to resolve you know, the pay models different for everybody, but in the end, they count on you undervaluing yourself. And it is not your fault that Gronk pays crap. What is the fault is to accept that they, you have to hit some arbitrary RVU you that you're not able to obtain. So one of the ways, so I no longer do critical care at all. The reason I was able to prove that to them was that every time I brought somebody, if they have a new medical record, the first time they've entered the University of Chicago is through me, my patient, every dollar that we make after that is because of me. So that lung cancer diagnosis, both back to me, chemo, radiation, pet, yada, 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 cash, tons of profit, right, for the medical center, that patient came in because of me. And I was able to track that my Bronx numbers plummeted every time they forced me to be inside the ICU wasting my time. And so I said, the money is dropping while I'm doing something that anyone else in our group can do. Because only I can do the place before I have partners. Only I can do the Bronx, but anyone can do the ICU. So stop putting me there. Yeah. And I did the same thing. So just internally. Just, I just, I just, I mean, I just knew it. If, you know, you know how your medical records are. Anytime the medical record are starting with a five, and you're a newbie. And so it was like, uh, you know, that was it. And then I was bronching anyone with a two, three, or four, then, uh, you know, so they were around for a while. So when, when Kyle and I started this, right, we could do that, right? But now there's, there's stipulations. They don't have to share that information with us. But when I started, that's the whole reason I was able, 2011, to make the business case. We did the same thing, right? We did our, when I was with Super Dimension back in the day, we did the study. First year I did Super Dimension, we did 100 cases, right? And if you are new to our healthcare system, never touched until me. Everybody pushes back. Well, that wasn't, you didn't generate that. They would have come into the healthcare system. Like, but they weren't before. They never touched us before until they met me, right? So I'm going to count that. We have $1.4 million off of 90 patients because of what we did with a piece of capital and a novel finder. You take that and you go to a healthcare system. The first time I measured it at HCA before they cut off everything, $4.5 million the first year that I was there. $4.5 million, right? Just, I mean, so the data is there. So don't they won't pay you on your contribution margin or yourself, but don't undersell yourself and certainly don't go below the fair market valuation. By the way, side note, when you're looking for equipment, you know, remember, you know, so professional athletes never negotiate with ownership. They have an agent. So like you and if you want device X, that rep is highly incentivized, just like the agent is as well. The agent for a sports star wants to get the most out. That rep who's trying to sell whatever that you want, you want it as well. The two of you are a partnership. But they know how to speak to the C-suite better than you do. Have them say that we're together, 
They speak for me. Because why not? That person's heavily incentivized. This is their job to get through. You don't have time for all those meetings. The C-suite counts on how busy you are, that you won't show back up to that follow-up meeting. And by the way, if you don't show up to the follow-up meeting, you clearly didn't want it, right? So then they can kill it. You have an agent. You have a very incentivized agent, just like a sports star does. It's also okay to do that straight out of fellowship, right? You come in with the business plan at a fellowship, I need this capital, this is why I need it before I get there, these are the things I need in place, I need to talk to pathology, I need to have blog time. These are absolutely perfectly fine to go in asking for what you need to be successful. I'm not sure what, what you did when you were negotiating, but it's Yeah, I mean, sure. that, that's, uh, you know, I, I was lucky they, they had most of the equipment sent on, um, but that's gonna be a question into one of the things I, I wanna do. And um, it, it, uh, I think, you know, and, and I'm, I'm putting all of this in my mind, and that's why I said, you know, kind of keep your focus because you, you need the buy-in, and, and you know, doing the, the, the procedure, um, having the, the pre and post, that's all understandable and, and probably part of your practice uh, anyway. But the question is, do you have the buy-in? You know, because this is a whole system; it's a program, and then to build that program correctly. You need the backup, and then to have the backup, you have to have that conversation on open table. Look, this is what, what, what this offers. This is what the you know what the business model is, and then we're going to have some problems along the line. And if those problems happen, you guys need to be there with me, not not looking at like that. This is an issue that we need to fix because this is an expectation rather than a complication. I think that probably uniquely for BLDR and, and for other you need to have an open conversation and uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. All you have to do with the BLDR conversation is start with the DRG reimbursement, they will be nodding their heads. And you can well, figure out the workflow, start with the DRG reimbursement, they will say yes, can you make that happen? Well, also your gateway drug to a robot. Yeah, absolutely. Gateway drug. But if you have a, oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's interesting because I spoke to an industry person and they asked me the question, why do pulmonologists have a low self-esteem problem? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Except for Kyle. It was in thoracic surgery, I asked something, they want the best of the best, but the pulmonology is always like, oh, if you can, it would be great. Right. You know, you don't have to, but it would be fantastic. And I think, uh, bullying on Susan's point, you know, if you have your data and you show this is what I'm able to do, this is what I've done, I'm building on my success. You just, it just grows and grows and grows. I mean, literally the first one, the hospital system I was at before, I went in, I had the data, I had, you know, I just presented this, publicized this, I had my, my business plan, I had my ROI, he kept looking at my badge and he was like, are you a lung doctor? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, are, you, are, you, are you gonna be a surgeon? I'm like, no, still just a language. But wait, I don't, I don't understand. And so I left that hospital system, and I sent him a very, very nice email. You know, a, we went gangbusters when we left. It would be you're going to fall on your face, and you're doing like you did like 100, and we did 700 after that. So we did, just don't undersell yourself. They do not know who you are. They do not know what you can do. If you come with data first, and you lead with that, first of all, lead with their problem, right? Because they are your, your stage is awful. You know, your throughput, your out migration, all those things are awful. You have so much to solve, but we don't have a strong voice. We don't have the voice. And so let us help you gain the voice. And that was a perfect segue. So I have to say that, you know, as the Society of Advanced Bronchoscopy kind of continues to grow, um, Hussam, myself, and Hassanin, we're on the education committee. We're trying to always include more fellows, more learning opportunities. And we recently launched a fellows corner so any of those of you who are at an at a academic center, please feel free to pass this information along to your fellows, to your residents, whether it's pulmonary critical care or IP, I think this is going to be a great opportunity for them to highlight, highlight and showcase any interesting cases they have, and they'll have mentorship from one of us at the SAB. Um, and then Dominique is also doing a lot of great work with his podcast, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, I think this came about by you know, the problems that we were encountering. Um, as folks have said, you know, fellowship doesn't train you for everything. There's a lot of learning that you have to do afterwards. And they didn't teach us how to build a lung module program. They didn't teach us how to care for these patients. It was like, show you how to do a couple of bronchoscopies. So when you realize, oh, this is on you, like, it's only you in the community that's going to take care of it, you've got to go and dig down. And 
a lot of the podcasts that we're doing are basically, you know, pain points, stuff that I don't know how to do. I have biopsy, mm -hmm. never done that. I heard it caused a lot of bleeding. Um, <laughs> so basically, you know, I looked at the articles and said, oh, Kat Oberg's done this paper. Let's go interview her, get her insights. And I think going with the attitude of, I don't know this, but I need to know this. Um, and if I'm having this problem, I'm sure other folks are having this problem. And I think that's what's uh, been really helpful about like speaking to folks and a lot of great feedback. But everyone's encountering the same problems. So we're solving these problems together. Uh, if I could say one thing from what Steve said, what builds a program at this, at this time today is robotic drunk It's not rigid, it's not sense. And so each one of us can learn robotic bronchoscopy, navigation bronchoscopy, and that is what builds a program. And Steve talked about building a program collaboratively. Um, I want to say I have two advanced bronchoscopists on the same, on the same road on Highway 50 in Kenosha at Freighter itself. And uh, Jonathan Kerman over here also knows the same program. It's Freighter itself. I happen to be there to help them build that program. So, so again, it's collaboration, not competition. And, and this is what builds a program. It's, it's, if you want to start building a program and talk to your C-suite and get the data from the data analytics team from any of the robotic companies, it's robotic bronchoscopy, BLBRs that make you the money. So forget about widgets, forget about stents. Those things happen once every a month, once every two months, or maybe six months, depending on what part of the world you are. But robotic navigation, bronchoscopy, their bread and butter, that will build your program. And in the spirit of collaboration, if you guys are not currently members of SA Wave, our QR code is up here. Please uh, join us for any fellows that are here. Membership is free, which is not what you can say for most societies. So um, please, like I said, please join us. If you have topics that you'd want us to address, whether on the education side or on the podcast, we're open to comments and suggestions. And um, I'd also say we're, we're having a strategy meeting to kind of figure out what other things we want to do. So Susan, myself, Gus, a bunch of leaders will be kind of sitting down thinking about, you know, what is the need out there? What are we missing? We're missing some opportunities for people. There's a hunger, there's a desire, and not just robotics. There's like, I mean, I just came back from, you know, some missionary work, and there was like flexible bronchoscopy and for the general population. You, you go to Asia a lot to work. I mean, the world needs people that are, understand this space. They don't just need technicians. They need people that want to take care of patients and populations and understand them, navigate through this very complex journey with the tool of mastery of bronchoscopy. So whatever ideas we're missing, whether it be a live meeting, whether it be something different, um, let us know We have ideas. if you have ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think the goal is, this is really the first time that we've done this as a think tank to try to get together to strategically think about where we need to go. So we need to hear from the audience, is it where you have SAV version of our guidelines? I think the podcast is a little bit undersold. I think the podcast is so important because we're digesting the best of the best. So we're not just like interpreting the article ourselves. We're going to the PI and saying, what are we missing? What do we need to know? Is that helpful? Okay, is that what you need? So we really need feedback from you on how to transform the space. We want to be pushed as well. So let us know, is that better industry partnership? Can we do better together? We spend 10 minutes with a few of our gold sponsors. Is that enough? Probably not. Like, how do we do things better? But um, this is really our first attempt to come together to think really, what's our one, three, five year plan? Um, and really stick to that. So we're gonna rely on our members um, to help us really shape that. 